Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering 2023 recruiting best practices to ensure compliance. I'm Katie Kreider, Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the very first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support the entire employee life cycle. We offer a complete suite of products that will help support organizations through recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with proactive, reliable service and a deep HR and a payroll expertise. And at NP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm super excited to introduce your presenters for today's program, Erica Sutton and Jason Armada. Erica is the Director of Recruiting Services at NP. She has been the talent in the talent acquisition field for over 10 years, holding various positions in the agency staffing and corporate talent acquisition. Prior to joining MP, Erica was the senior director for the talent acquisition team of a noted global company. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Southern Indiana. Jason is the sales director for recruiting services at MP. He has close to 20 years of sales experience in agency staffing and the technology industry. Prior to joining MP, Jason held leadership and partnership roles working with clients across all industries, including small business, mid-market, and Fortune 500 companies. And just a few quick housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar later today, along with all the slides that you see today. So with all of that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Jason. Thank you, Katie, and thank you all for joining today's webinar on recruiting best practices and compliance. Uh, it's, more, uh, it's more important than ever to stay on top of the latest developments and changes in recruiting compliance. Whether you're an HR professional, a recruiter, or a hiring manager, this webinar is designed to help you navigate the complex and ever-changing landscape of compliance regulations. We'll be covering a wide range of topics from new laws and regulations to best practices for ensuring compliance in your hiring process. By attending this webinar, you'll gain a deeper understanding of the compliance landscape and how it affects your organization. You'll learn practical tips and strategies for staying compliant and avoiding costly legal issues, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as Katie mentioned. We're excited to have you here with us today, and we're confident that you'll find this webinar to be both informative and engaging. If during the webinar you have a question, please utilize the Q&A feature. We will hold all questions until the end of the webinar, and we've allowed enough time for uh, those questions and some of our responses. Some of the key topics we'll cover today are government agencies, to know top compliance concerns trending with companies today, and ways to minimize your risk. Let's get started with a couple of agencies and acronyms you're likely aware of, but do you know their responsibilities and oversights? Two agencies you've likely heard of are the EEOC, or the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and the OFCCP, or the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs. The EEOC, or Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is a federal agency in the United States that enforces laws prohibiting workplace discrimination based on factors such as race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. The EEOC also works to prevent retaliation against individuals who have filed discrimination complaints or participated in investigations related to discrimination. The EEOC is important to recruiting because it ensures that all job applicants are given equal consideration, regardless of their race, gender, religion, or other protected characteristics. This means that employers cannot discriminate against job applicants or employees during the recruitment process or throughout their employment. By enforcing these laws, the EEOC helps to create a fairer and more equal workplace for all individuals, which can lead to, an inc to increased productivity in a more diverse and inclusive work environment. The OFCCP, or Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, is a federal agency within the US Department of Labor that enforces equal employment opportunity and affirmative action, for, informative 
affirmative action regulations for federal contractors and subcontractors. These regulations ensure that federal contractors and subcontractors do not discriminate against job applicants and employees based on their race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or status as a protected veteran. The OFCCP is important in recruiting because it helps to promote equal employment opportunities and diversity within the workplace. Federal contractors and subcontractors are required to comply with OFCCP guidelines in their recruiting and hiring processes, which includes outreach efforts to un underrepresented groups and the maintenance of detailed records to demonstrate compliance. By enforcing these regulations, the OFCCP helps to create a level playing field for all job ap applicants and employees, regardless of their protective status. If your organization is a federal contractor or a subcontractor, it is important to comply with regulations to maintain your status as a federal contractor and to avoid any potential legal and financial penalties for non-compliance. Let's take a few moments now to dive a bit deeper into what the EEOC and OFCCP cover and how they ensure you're in compliance. You're probably saying, yes, I've heard of the EEOC before, but how do I ensure I'm following the guidelines and laws the EEOC oversees? Here are some steps you can take to ensure you are compliant with EEOC laws and to mitigate your risks. Train your hiring managers and HR staff. Ensure those responsible for hiring and recruiting understand the laws enforced by the EEOC and how to avoid discriminatory practices. Do your hiring managers understand the questions in an interview that could be asked and can be considered discriminatory? Sometimes questions such as, oh, what country are you from? Can seem innocent at the moment, but are discriminatory. Leaders, HR professionals, and hiring managers should be sure to ask interview questions that are fair, job-related, and focus on the candidate's skills qualifications and experience to avoid any potential discrimination. Managers should stick to these questions that are directly relevant to the positions being filled and avoid any questions that could lead to any discriminatory bias. Develop non-discriminatory job descriptions. Create job descriptions that focus on the skills and qualifications necessary for the job rather than on characteristics that may be discriminatory. Examples could include saying, the job requires the ability to lift 15 pounds regularly and not that the applicant is in peak physical condition. Avoid gendered language, use gender neutral language whenever possible. For example, use they instead of he or she and chairperson instead of chairman. Uh, use inclusive language, use language that is inclusive of all candidates. For example, use people with disabilities instead of disabled people and candidates of all backgrounds instead of diverse candidates. Post jobs in diverse places. Make sure that your job ads are posted in places that are accessible to a diverse pool of candidates, such as on job boards and social media platforms that cater to various demographics. Something we see with clients at times is only posting position on the company's LinkedIn page. Alternatively, applicant tracking systems or ATSs can post to hundreds of job boards for low monthly cost. Utilizing an ATS can also assist with rec record keeping of your company's hiring practices, documenting your compliance. Conduct fair and consistent interviews. Ask all candidates the same questions and assess them based on their qualifications, skills, and experience, rather than on their personal characteristics. Well-constructed interview guides based on key competencies of a job are best, to, uh, best practice to ensure fair consideration for all. If guides are used, remember that they may be maintained and could be pulled, uh, they, excuse me, they must be maintained and could be pulled as part of an investigation or audit of any hiring practices. Hiring managers should be well-trained in how to use and take notes in an interview guide your company has provided. Document your hiring process. Keep detailed records of all job postings, applications, interviews, and hiring decisions. This documentation can help demonstrate that your hiring process is fair and non-discriminatory. 
process documents, ensure that you are also training your human resources, talent acquisition or hiring managers on the correct way to source, recruit and hire candidates. Follow EEOC guidelines for background checks. If you choose to conduct background checks on job applicants, ensure that you follow EEOC guidelines and avoid using criminal history as an autom automate, automatic disqualification. We will cover more on this topic a little bit later as uh, we move along. With that, let's move to the second agency to familiarize yourself with the OFCCP. If you're a company that does business or holds government contracts, you would also be subject to governing by the, e, the OFCCP. Some items that would ensure your business and recruiting practices, practices are up to par for potential OFCCP audit would be to, one, develop an affirmative action plan, an AAP. If you're a federal contractor or subcontractor, you are required to develop and maintain an AAP. The AAP should outline the steps you will take to promote equal op uh, employment opportunity and diversity within your organization. I will share in an upcoming slide some areas you can ensure, uh, you should ensure that are covered on your AAP. Conduct outreach to un underrepresented groups. Your AAP should include outreach efforts to unrepresented groups such as women, minorities, and individuals with disabilities. You should document your outreach efforts and track the results. Maintain detailed records. You should maintain detailed records of your recruiting and hiring process, including job, job postings, resumes, applications, and interview notes. You should also track the demographics of job applicants and hires. Avoid discriminatory practices. You should ensure that your recruiting and hiring process are non-discriminatory and based on job-related qualifications. You should avoid practices that may have a disparate in, impact on protected groups, such as requiring college degree for a position where it is not job-related. Conduct regular self-audits. You should conduct regular self-audits to ensure compliance with the OFCCP regulations. This includes re reviewing your recruiting and hiring processes, as well as your outreach efforts and recording practices. Now that we've discussed some of the important compliance areas mandated by the OFCCP, let's take a deeper dive into the affirmative action plans and the components needed within one. Organizations that have federal contracts or some contracts of 50,000 or more and employees and employees 50 or more employees are required to have an affirmative action plan an affirmative action plan is proactive is a proactive tool that com companies use to promote diversity and inclusion in the workplace by taking affirmative steps to ensure equal employment opportunities for underrepresented groups. Here are some reasons why organizations need to have an AAP. Legal compliance. Federal contractors and subcontractors are required by law to have an affirmative action plan as a condition of their contracts. Failure to comply with affirmative action regulations could result in san sanctions, including the loss of federal contracts. Promote diversity and inclusion. An AAP provides a framework for organizations to identify and address potential barriers to equal employment opportunities for underrepresented groups, such as women, minorities, and individuals with disabilities. By taking affirmative steps to promote diversity and inclusion, and inclusion organizations can create a more diverse and inclusive workplace that benefits all employees. Improve recruitment and retention. By actively recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce, organizations can benefit from a wider pool of talent, perspectives, and experiences, which can improve in organizational performance and competitiveness. Enhance organizational reputation. Organizations that demonstrate a commitment to diversity and inclusion through affirmative action plans can enhance their reputation as socially responsible employers and attract employees and customers who value diversity. On the screen are the components that should be included in a well-written AAP. Larger organizations are likely to have a resource to get dedicated to AAP, but at times these responsibilities lie within an HR business partner or HR manager's role. There are tools 
available to assist in the collection of AAP data, such as applicant tracking systems or predictive people analytics. If you're someone who's spending time manually pulling spreadsheets and calculating headcount by hand, there is definitely a better way. So with that, we're gonna take a quick transition and I believe we're gonna go ahead and pop up a survey uh, for everyone that's on the call that can participate in that. So uh, the question is roughly how many job postings does your, currently, does your current company um, have active? Uh, one to five, five to 10, 10 to 15 and 15 plus. So we'll give everyone a minute there to log their results. And with that, I believe we'll now pass it on to Erica and we'll share some of those results as we move along here later on in the conversation. Thank you, Jason. And yes, it looks like the polls wrapped up um, pretty evenly split between one to five um, and then 15 plus. So we're either hiring um, a lot or you know not as much and possibly just filling people who unfortunately have turned over um, maybe at the role of those one to five organizations or the 15 plus area. So thank you for sharing your, uh, your feedback there with us. Um, always good to know, you know kind of who's looking to hire and how many are you looking to hire as we talk about recruiting and compliance. So I think I gave Jason the, the hardest part of the presentation here in our webinar, um, talking about those government uh, agencies um, and some compliance things that are, are obviously very, very important in each of them. We're going to spend uh, the next part of our time together talking about just some compliance areas to consider. Um, so as we're working with uh, industries and companies across all sizes, when we surveyed those, uh, the next four topics we'll discuss were some of the hot button issues of their leadership and HR teams. We've already talked about some of these um, throughout when Jason was speaking, but the next section is going to cover DE&I, so companies that need to ensure their recruiting practices are inclusive and they're actively seeking out uh, candidates from a diverse range of backgrounds, the use of technology, so how is that uh, in relation to compliance, um, a huge hot thing, obviously continuing is the use of technology uh, to recruit and in the HR space, salary transparency, um, anywhere you go, LinkedIn, uh, any HR website currently, um, this is a very, very hot topic around complying with wage and hour laws, including minimum wage requirements, pay transparency statements, um, and just being transparent uh, with the process. And then lastly, background checks, drug screens, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, we're going to spend some time together covering you know, those laws, regulations, and how to stay compliant with, within them. So moving on um, to the first topic of, of DE&I, uh, compliance concerns with recruiting and DE&I uh, refer to ensuring that companies comply with legal and ethical requirements when it comes to their recruiting and hiring practices. So here are some compliance concerns that companies may have uh, with recruiting and DE&I. So those anti-discrimination uh, laws Companies need to comply with anti-discrimination laws that prohibit the discrimination based on race, color, sex, national origin, sex, religion, age, disability, or genetic information. Companies need to ensure that their recruiting practices are non-discriminatory and open to all qualified candidates. Affirmative action, like Jason just talked about, uh, replies to companies that may be required to implement affirmative action plans to ensure equal employment opportunities for minorities and women. Companies need to ensure that their recruiting practices align with these plans and have ways to document and report the progress. As Jason just discussed, building an AAP is a critical mission for organizations who are regulated by those OFCCP compliance regulations. Fair hiring practices. Companies need to ensure that their hiring practices are fair, transparent, and open to all qualified candidates. They should avoid any bias or preferential treatment towards any specific group. So ensuring your processes around talent acquisition and sourcing are well-documented will assist in this area. Inclusive recruitment. Companies need to ensure that their recruitment practices are inclusive and attract a diverse pool of candidates. 
They should avoid language or practices that may discourage certain um, groups and individuals from applying. Again, as Jason discussed earlier, this could include taking a look at your job postings and the words used within them. Sometimes verbiage used could disengage a certain candidate. Um, AI technology would be great with assisting with this task. Um, I know real big in, in the news or chat GPT and, and asking, you know, what um, phrases could be considered um, instead of another phrase. So it would be more inclusive to all applicants. Background checks, which we're going to dive into in a little bit further, but companies need to ensure that any background checks they perform on job applicants are legal and comply with those EEOC laws. They should avoid any practices that may be unfairly screening out certain groups. So we'll discuss this more in depth in a few sides, including a few insights on the ban the box movement um, that is really popular in discussions right now. The accommodation of disabilities. Companies need to provide reasonable accommodations to job applicants with disabilities to ensure equal employment opportunities. So do you have a current practice in place in which a candidate can reach out if they need an accommodation to complete an applicant or an application or an EEO area on your website that directs potential applications um, or applicants on a process to follow for assistance? If not, it's something you should consider. Retaliation. EEOC laws prohibit retaliation against employees who file complaints or participate in investigations related to discrimination or harassment. Companies need to ensure that their recruiting practices do not encourage or tolerate retaliation against job applicants who exercise those legal rights. Overall, companies need to be uh, considerate of all those things um, around DE&I, uh, which is a very big topic uh, today. Secondly, let's look at the use of technology. So when using technology to recruit, companies should be aware of compliance concerns related to those EEOC laws as well. Uh, data privacy, cybersecurity are some of the compliance concerns that a company should be worried about when using technology to recruit. So we're going to talk a little bit about the cons and then move over into the pros of utilizing technology because there are certainly both. Discrimination. Companies need to ensure that their technology-based recruiting practices are non-discriminatory and do not unfairly screen out certain groups of candidates. For example, Algorithms that use biased data or training sets may result in discriminatory outcomes. Companies need to monitor and test their technology solutions to ensure they comply with these EEOC laws. Data privacy. Companies should ensure company um, can comply with data privacy laws when collecting, storing, and processing job application data or personal identifying information, PII. They should ensure that technology solutions have appropriate security measures in place to protect the job applicant data from unauthorized use or misuse. Cybersecurity, which goes along with the data privacy slightly, um, companies need to ensure that their technology solutions for recruiting are secure and not vulnerable to those cyber attacks. A data breach can result in the theft of job application data, which could be used for identity theft or other malicious practices. So companies should um, definitely ensure security best practices and monitor their systems for any security breaches. Accessibility. Companies need to ensure that technology solutions for recruiting are accessible to candidates with disabilities. They should follow the accessibility guidelines to make reasonable accommodations to ensure that candidates can assess and use their systems. This kind of talks a little bit about what I just talked about with ensuring that there's a practice in place or a spot where uh, potential candidates could go to find out how to, you know, get a reasonable accommodation to complete uh, an application. And lastly, transparency, which we will talk about again in a few minutes. Companies need to ensure that their technology solutions for recruiting are transparent and provide candidates with clear information about the data that's being collected and how it's being used. They should provide um, candidates with the opportunity uh, to correct any of the inaccurate data uh, that may be listed. On the flip side, using an applicant tracking system or other technology can provide so many benefits uh, to an organization to help mitigate risks. So consistency. An applicant tracking system can help ensure that all candidates are evaluated and treated consistently through the recruitment process, which can help prevent discrimination and ensure compliance with the EEOC laws. 
Record keeping. An ATS can maintain detailed records of a candidate's application, um, including the resume, cover letter, uh, communication history, messages sent, emails. Um, this can help demonstrate compliance with record keeping and data privacy regulations uh, that are so important to keep track of. Audit trails. So, you know, applicant tracking systems can create an audit trail that tracks every step of the recruiting process, including candidate sourcing, where they come from, the screenings that went through, the interviews that occurred, and any hiring steps that a candidate may have gone through. This can help demonstrate compliance with laws and regulations that require transparency and accountability in hiring practices. Reporting. An ATS can generate reports that provide insight into the recruitment process, such as time to hire, diversity metrics, and a source of hire. This can help identify areas for improvement and ensure compliance with reporting requirements or creation of those affirmative action plans. Lastly, um, certainly not least, the automated compliance checks that could be um, integrated with an applicant tracking system. So an applicant tracking system can automate compliance checks such as verifying that job postings comply with EEOC laws or flagging potential issues with a candidate information. Some ATSs can also integrate the initiation of a candidate's background check with an external vendor and the adjudication or ruling of a return background check based upon a matrix directly into the system. This can help reduce the risk of non-compliance and minimize the impact of human error or judgment. Moving on to salary transparency, where I said we would we would come back and definitely discuss this uh, as one of the biggest hot button topics right now is around salary transparency. So salary transparency is the practice of openly sharing information about compensation and benefits with employees or job applicants. While it's benefits such as promoting fairness, inclusion, and retention, there are also some compliance concerns that a company should be aware of when implementing salary transparency in recruitment. Um, and we're just gonna take a few minutes to discuss just some of them. So pay equity. Salary transparency can expose pay disparities uh, between employees, candidates, uh, which may lead to legal actions or uh, representational damage. If these disparities are based upon discriminatory practices. So to avoid this, a company should ensure that their compensation practices comply, obviously, with EEOC laws and are fair and consistent across all groups of employees or candidates. Data privacy. Sharing salary information with job applicants or employees may involve collecting and processing sensitive personal data. Uh, which is subject to data privacy laws. Companies should ensure that they collect and process data in compliance with applicable laws to protect it from unauthorized um, access or misuse, which ties back to um, the technology conversation we just had. Antitrust laws. Sharing salary information with competitors or participating in agreements to fix compensation or benefits may violate antitrust laws, which prohibit anti-competitive behavior. Companies should avoid any practices that may result in collusion or price fixing with other employers. May have an impact as well on, on employee morale. Um, sharing salary information with employees may affect their motivation and morale if they perceive that their compensation is unfair or lower than their peers. Companies should communicate clearly and openly with employees about their compensation practices and provide opportunities for feedback and grievances. Probably the biggest one here that we're gonna take a few minutes to discuss after the slide are the legal requirements. Some states and countries have um, laws or regulations that require employers to provide salary information to all job applicants or report pay data to government agencies. Companies should be aware of these legal requirements and comply with them to avoid legal actions or penalties. Uh, remote hiring may bring even more challenges as specific states such as California and Colorado require specific items to be listed on a job posting. Hiring remotely and not listing these items could open your company up to fines. 
Uh, so we're going to briefly take a look at some of those states and laws, but uh, certainly not all of them. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, which this chart is from, uh, women made 83 cents for every dollar made by men in 2020. These disparities are even greater among Black women, 64 cents, and Hispanic women, 57 cents. The persistent wage gap has spawned uh, pay equity and pay transparency laws throughout the country that you can see here. Mississippi, um, the state that doesn't have a color assigned to it here, is the only state uh, with no pay transparency or equity laws. Like all employment laws, the pay equity laws vary significantly state to state, but all address pay discrimination based on gender and or other protected classifications. There are 21 states with statewide laws that prohibit recruiters and hiring managers from asking job seekers their salary history or have bans to protect employees um, who discuss pay with coworkers. In those states, employers can discuss a candidate's salary expectations. However, they cannot inquire about their current salary. The newest trends sweeping the nation are pay transparency laws requiring employers to provide salary ranges either when requested, both for employees or applicants, or include the pay ranges in their job postings. You may think this does not apply to you, but are you considering hiring in remote locations? So it very well may. We're gonna take a look now at just some of the states. Um, again, this, this changes quite often uh, that have pay transparency laws. Um, so those states listed on here, California um, has a California Fair Pay Equity Act, requires employers to provide applicants with the pay scale for a position upon reasonable request. Um, Illinois, the Illinois Equal Pay Act requires that employers provide applicants with a pay scale for a position upon request. Um, you'll find that some of these are very, very similar. Um, New York City, the New York City human rights law requires that um, employers post a salary or hourly range for a position in a job posting. So that's specific to New York City. Um, so as you know, and we know as HR professionals, these are rules, laws, regulations that are ever changing. Um, but there's one thing you always should consider is, is thinking about you know, those remote opportunities. Um, so if you're hiring you know, remotely and the candidate may sit in Colorado or may sit in California or one of these states or, or counties or even cities that have a pay transparency law, um, you could be opening yourself up to potential risks by not you know, knowing these and considering them when you're posting in these different states or you know, cities or counties like I had just discussed. So let's uh, move on to discussing uh, background checks and the FCRA process, the ban the box movement and drug screening laws, big topics. While we certainly could likely conduct a whole webinar on the laws, regulations, and rules around backgrounds, drug screens, and FCRA, uh, we're going to just talk about some key points you'd want to consider in each of the areas. Um, so when conducting background checks on job applicants, uh, the company is must comply with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is FCRA, a uh, federal law that requires the collection, use, and disclosure of customer or consumer, sorry, information. So here are some compliance concerns that uh, companies may have about the uh, background screens and FCRA process. So disclosure and authorization. The FCRA requires employers to provide job applicants with a clear uh, disclosure that a background check is going to and will be conducted. They must obtain written authorization and provide a summary of their rights under the FCRA. Adverse action. If the employer decides not to hire an applicant based upon the background check, the FCRA requires them to provide an applicant with a pre-adverse action notice, a copy of that report, and a summary of their rights under the FCRA. The applicant in this must then have an opportunity to dispute any accuracies in the report before the employer takes adverse action. Depending on what states um, you may be hiring in or working within, uh, those, those laws are different um, by state with how long um, the affirmative action and adverse action um, clause is in different states. Accuracy. Um, so 
Employers must ensure that information on the background check report is accurate and up to date, of course. Uh, they should use a reputable and reliable consumer reporting agency to conduct background checks and verify the information with the applicant or the source of the information if there's any discrepancies that are found. Discrimination. So employers must ensure that their background screening process our policies do not have a disparate impact on protected groups under the EEOC laws. They should conduct an individualized assessment on each applicant's criminal history and consider factors such as the nature and gravity of the offense, the time elapsed since the offense, and the relevance of the job. So conducting that you know, individualized assessment. State and local laws. So some states and local jurisdictions have additional requirements or restrictions on the use of criminal history and employment decisions. Employers should be aware of these laws and comply with them. One of the newer movements is titled Ben the Box. You've probably heard a little bit about that and, and we'll talk about it in just a few minutes. Ban the box refers to a movement that aims to remove the checkbox um, on applications that asks about an applicant's criminal history. The box is typically marked with the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime or a similar inquiry? The movement advocates for removing this question from job applications in order to give individuals with criminal records a fair chance of employment. Ban the Box is aimed at reducing employment discrimination against individuals with criminal records who often face significant barriers to finding work. Advocates for the movement argue that checking the box on a job application is an early screening tool that just appropriately affects certain groups, including people of color and those from lower social and economic backgrounds who are more likely to have criminal records. By removing the box, um, employers are encouraged to consider job candidates and their merit and qualification rather than making assumptions about their su suitability based upon criminal history. As of 2021, more than 35 states and over 150 cities and countries um, in the United States, or counties, sorry, in the United States, have implemented some form of ban the box litigation, um, which obviously prevents employees from asking about criminal history on the job applications. However, the exact details and extent of these laws vary by jurisdiction. Some laws only apply to public employers, while others apply to other employers in the jurisdiction. Um, some laws have also have exceptions for certain positions, such as jobs that involve working with children or in the baking industry, et cetera. While we'll not spend time reviewing each of these during our time together today, this should be something that's put on your list of items to review in your current hiring process. Uh, do you know uh, what states you're hiring in? Do you know the laws of which those states around salary transparency, background adjudication, and our next topic together, drug screening? Employers should be aware that other laws besides the state cannabis law may implicate employers' ability to regulate employee cannabis use. Um, so those would be maybe federal laws, um, the Department of Transportation, let's say, um, state disability discrimination laws, uh, lawful off-duty conduct laws, religious accommodation, wrongful termination and violation of public policy, and any state drug testing laws. Currently, employers may have a drug testing policy prohibiting employees from working under the influence of cannabis. However, employers should review potential obligations under both the applicable cannabis law and laws listed above when they apply to their policy. If an employee requests an accommodation to use cannabis during work or work while under the influence of cannabis, employers should consult with an attorney. Obviously, this is an ever-changing landscape. You can see by the map above uh, which states uh, may have medical um, or medical and recreational allowances for cannabis. Um, this is obviously a very hot topic in talent acquisition, and we would just caution you to work, make sure you work with an HR partner um, as you discuss or, or items like this come up. A lot of information. Thanks, Erica. Um, I know just to recap uh, and uh, summarize some of the information uh, we reviewed today. Um, some of the ways to minimize the risk uh, to your organization. So 
One is to define and document your recruiting practices, which we covered extensively today. Uh, train those individuals in the hiring process. Um, those are your managers, your internal team, um, anyone involved in, in meeting with candidates. Stay up to date on legal changes by sus subscribing to relevant HR updates, uh, industry related uh, and others. Utilize technology when it's available to create efficiencies with the evolution uh, of so many uh, technical resources just in the past year. Um, it is uh, very easy to automate uh, a lot of the functionality we've discussed here as well. And uh, definitely important, be transparent as be, be as transparent as possible um, throughout your process as you're documenting um, and sharing information uh, with everyone involved. So with that, um, that is gonna wrap up the information sharing uh, that we've gone through uh, this afternoon, this morning for some of you still. Um, and now we're gonna move into some questions uh, that have been posted uh, to the chat uh, that Eric and I will field. And uh, some of those we'll be able to answer now. Um, if there is more specific or detailed questions that do come up, uh, we'll make sure that uh, one of our specialists, either in our HR consulting um, or recruiting uh, side of the MP, uh, human, cap human Capital Management Solutions, will follow up with you. So, Erica, do we have any relevant questions that we can review at this time? Looks like we have just a couple here. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and read the first one. So, because uh, I'm an HR manager at a company that drug tests their candidates during the pre-employment process, um, as a whole, do you feel less companies are performing drug tests for pre-employment purposes? Um, so short answer is yes. I feel like that that's certainly a trend um, that I think from the SHRM, so the Society for Human Resource Management, um, over the past couple of years has continuously seen a, a decline um, in, in drug testing as pre-employment. Obviously, like considering... Uh, the, the role someone may be going into um, and whether the drug screen is, is an applicable um, screening for the position. Um, obviously, other positions may need a drug screen and, and some do not. So uh, we see that in healthcare um, and safety sensitive roles. So transportation, uh, manufacturing, healthcare. Uh, but I think there's been at least about a 10% decline uh, in pre-employment drug testing. And it's, it's something that, you know, it continues to be a hot topic and, and a consideration point when you, when you back up, you know, is it relevant to the job and, 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 and the role that is being done and, and the laws that are out there right now. So uh, it's a really good question and a, a hot topic right now, um, you know, as, as people are looking to bring on, you know, as many, as many folks as they can um, in some industries. Yeah, and I'm sure with all the changes in the cannabis laws that um, continue to impact each and every state, it's going to be important for, again, to stress with everyone to, to stay in touch with um, all those updates and the laws um, and uh, either with any internal resources you have or to ensure that you're bringing on uh, an outside consultant that is very well versed and has uh, that information regularly updated and can share it with you as well. Right. I think that's somebody's question too, was there are so many laws and they change so rapidly, uh, especially around pay transparency. Um, how, how can somebody make sure that they're up to speed, Jason? Yeah, so there's a couple of different resources. Obviously, um, Sherm is a great one. Um, there is the ability to bring on uh, some additional resources. Um, as mentioned, MP does have um, uh, an HR consulting group. If you're not familiar with our HR services team, uh, they have the ability to do uh, support a lot of different areas that we talked about today, but um, really uh, being abreast of all that information, help you reduce liability and legal, legal exposure, um, really get the best strategies for your organization. Um, we understand that um, you know it's, it's not a one size fits all, relative to uh, organizations and their HR needs. So I believe at the end of, of the call and uh, with some follow-up information, we can share uh, the recording um, of this call to everyone that has participated. We can send that out. 
Um, and in that, we'll also include some information if you do want to set up a consultation uh, with Eric and myself uh, regarding any of the uh, rec uh, recruiting specific questions or needs that you have. Um, or again, we have the ability to set up a, a consultation with uh, someone on our HR services group um, who can an answer a lot of those legal and compliance questions as well. So I think Erica um, will just highlight again, um, somewhat of a shameless plug on our end. We have the ability from our recruiting services group uh, to help you streamline a lot of this process. Um, Erica's uh, talent acquisition and fulfillment team, um, really well-versed um, in all of the applicant uh, tracking functionality, as well as compliance that we've reviewed here today. So if you are looking to support or have support with outsourcing some of those recruiting functions, we'd be happy to discuss with you a little bit further how we can help shorten that time to hire, save you some money, but also make sure that we're in compliance with all the, the various areas that we did cover today. Uh, so we have some contact information there on the screen. And again, uh, we'll follow up as an organization with a copy of this recording um, and any additional resources, you can uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Erica, and uh, we're happy to, to answer any questions or at least put you in touch with someone internally in our organization that can better help you. Erica, anything else you want to add here at the end? No, I thank you for attending. We hope you uh, learned a lot today. And there was a lot of information that shared, of course, around uh, recruiting and, and EOC and OFCCP. And I think we used the entire alphabet today in some sort of, um, some sort of way to uh, list out something in town acquisition or compliance. So um, I know a couple of you had questions that are specific to um, your company. Like Jason said, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Thank you so much for attending today. Have a great rest of your Wednesday um, and good luck with your hiring. Awesome. Thanks so much, Erica and Jason. To learn more about MP's full service solutions for 2023 and more, you can check us out at mp-hr.com for more information. And to join us for our upcoming webinar next week on 2023 training, best practices, compliance, and reducing risk, you can visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming events. Um, and available resources. Like Erica and Jason both stated, we will be sending out the recording um, and the presentation later today. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a terrific day.